This week, I want to talk about the digestive system and supporting the digestive system with plant medicine. So that's kind of a broad category. There's a lot of uh, different parts to the digestive tract, the gastrointestinal tract is sometimes called, uh, and uh, a lot of different things that can go wrong. Um, different things that you can do to try and put things right correspondingly. But uh, in practice, a lot of the time, there are certain things that will come up over and over that you're very likely to see if you are um, taking care of family and friends. Uh, and there are other things that are likely to see if you're ever in clinical practice. Uh, and so we'll get into a little bit about each of those categories. Uh, first, I want to talk a little bit about just a general overview of the anatomy and physiology of the digestive system. So the digestive system is really foundational to health because everything in your body is made from nutrients that you gather through your digestive system. So if the digestive system isn't working right, if nourishment isn't working right, uh, then, then nothing is going to work as well as it could. So it's just kind of like the very foundation that everything else comes from, whether it's muscles, bones, nerves, the heart, the kidneys, everything like that, hydration, all of that comes into your body through your digestive system. Typically, in the world of anatomy and physiology, people think of the surfaces of the digestive system as being an exterior surface of the body, which is not really how we usually think about it in, in common thought necessarily. You might think of something as being in your stomach, as being inside your body, but from a more technical perspective, it's actually still outside your body it's just on the surface of your body that runs down the middle. Sort of like the inside of a donut hole is still the outside, still the crust of the donut. Uh, the lining of your digestive tract is not made out of skin. It's made out of epithelial tissue. The same stuff that the inside of your mouth is made out of more or less, though arranged a little bit differently. But, uh, but that's still considered a surface where your body is coming in contact with the environment. And specifically certain parts of the environment, like food that you have swallowed, water that you drink, that kind of thing. But that's still considered uh, an exterior surface of the body. So when something is in your digestive tract, it's not necessarily considered to be in your body yet until it's been broken down and absorbed into your bloodstream. So obviously the digestive system when things are working normally is a one way type of thing uh, in humans, not necessarily so in ruminants, cows and things like that. But in humans, usually it's a one way, one direction kind of thing. You swallow something and it, and it goes down and doesn't come back up. Um, things start out in your mouth and the process of digestion actually starts in your mouth too. Your teeth are breaking things up and just like, we talked about when we talked about making medicine in medicine, we talked about how the more surface area a medicine has, the easier it is for the substances in that medicine to come out into the liquid that you're extracting it into. Uh, in your digestive system, it's the same thing. The more broken up and chewed up something is, the easier it is for it to come out into the liquid of your digestive juices. So, First, it gets mixed with the saliva, then it goes into the stomach, it gets mixed with stomach acid, and then it goes from the stomach into the intestines, which switches from the external environment being acidic and breaking down the food to the external, to the environment being alkaline. In other words, the stomach has a very low acid pH, it contains an acidic, sour tasting substance, which probably we have all had the misfortune to taste our own. Uh, when vomiting, 
So that's stomach acid. It's mostly hydrochloric acid along with a lot of enzymes and water um, mixed with whatever food people have eaten. But once it gets into the small intestine, it changes into a bitter environment, uh, a high pH environment that allows, in particular, oils to be absorbed, to be emulsified, to be made able to mix with water, and therefore to be able to be absorbed into the body. So most of the absorption goes on in the small intestine. And that's really crucial because the small intestine is kind of very much deep within the body. You know, it's it's not, uh, we don't really see the stuff in the small intestine, you know, the, um, it's, uh, but it's, when it comes out, it's a substance called chyle and it's like a milky white substance inside the small intestine. And that's where a lot of, your nutrients are absorbed from your digestive system into your bloodstream. The small intestines are several meters long. And then when something's made its way through the small intestine, it's mostly in liquid form, goes into the large intestine, also known as the colon. And then it goes up, across, and then down. So the colon is sort of on the outside of where the small intestine is. So if you look up intestines and look at uh, some images you can easily find diagrams of this sort of thing but uh, the large intestine is mostly at that point is mostly waste product the body is reabsorbing water from it um, reabsorbing any fats some minerals that might still be in it but for the most part the absorption has already been done of the main nutrients like the starches the proteins and um, the fats, that's all getting absorbed along with a lot of vitamins and minerals that's getting absorbed through the small intestine. Um, so then things proceed into the large intestine and then, of course, are excreted. And by that point, they're usually in a solid form because most of the water has been reabsorbed through them. Um some of the things that most frequently go wrong when somebody has an issue with their digestive system are vomiting and diarrhea. So we've all experienced both of those, you know, similar principle in that the body is trying to get rid of stuff in a hurry. It's just which exit is closer and, uh, you know, which one is coming out through. So um, those are very common things if you're taking care of sick family members that you're likely to have to deal with. And fortunately, there are a lot of good herbal remedies for those kinds of things. Um, in terms of more long-term serious things of the sort that people might come to see you for as an herbalist, if you're ever in a, a practitioner type of setting, um, most of them are inflammatory issues. So vomiting and diarrhea are often just a matter of either uh, an infection, um, the presence of some sort of pathogen, or else a substance that didn't agree with your body. Like, for example, if you ate food that had some soap in it, uh, that, that will make you feel really sick. There's no germs involved, but it can cause vomiting, it can cause diarrhea. Um, and, you know, that's something that sometimes... Food sometimes gets contaminated with soap from people not washing cups or whatever. Um, so that sort of thing is not rare. Um, but the most common things are either stomach viruses, especially one called norovirus that's responsible for about 80% of what people uh, think of as being stomach viruses. Uh, or... The bacterial stuff is often food poisoning. So, you know, food that has gone bad uh, that might have something like salmonella or E. coli or something like that. Those can cause very severe bouts of, of diarrhea and sometimes nausea as well. Um, so, yeah, the viral things, people sometimes call it a stomach flu or something like that. Really, the term flu in 
modern English is short for influenza and it's that's a respiratory virus. Um, but sometimes people call other things flu. But uh, a lot of the time it's a, a virus called norovirus. Uh, sometimes it's other viruses, sometimes it's other bacteria. A lot of the time you don't know what it is. It doesn't really make that much difference because it's over in a couple of days anyway. And that's the usual course of things when somebody gets a stomach virus or when they eat a food that's maybe gone bad or something like that is that they have a few days where diarrhea and or nausea are really bad. And then, you know, as long as they stay hydrated through it, they get better. Typically, this is not a dangerous situation for an otherwise healthy adult or large child. But if you are very sick with other things, or if you are uh, immunocompromised, or your immune system is not very able to fight things off, or if you're a tiny baby or a frail older person, then it can be dangerous. And diarrheal illnesses actually kill a lot of people, especially children under five. Um, and often that's waterborne. Often that's from drinking water that has been contaminated with sewage, which is, uh, you know, a terrible thought and an easily prevented situation when there's a little bit of infrastructure to be had uh, for filtration or something of that sort. But sometimes there isn't. And uh, so that kind of illness is very, very common and deaths from it are a small portion, a very small fraction of the number of illnesses, but because that number is so big, the small fraction of it is a pretty large number as well. Uh, so, yeah, there are um, cases in which, scenarios in which something as simple as a diarrheal illness can be very dangerous. But most of the time it is. Most of the time it's merely unpleasant. And so as an herbalist, as somebody who is a serious student of plant medicine, you have the ability to use that knowledge to give some ease to people, to make things better for them, and to help them through situations like that. So before I go any further, I want to read to you a story about a rather more severe digestive system situation. This is from a book that I have here called Historia Aliquot Medici Rariores, which is just some select unusual medical cases. And let's see. This is taking place in the 1650s. It's written in the 1650s by a ancestor of mine who was a healer was uh, driven out of his land by some wars that were going on in England, Ireland, and Scotland at the time. And uh, he ends up going to another town, to a town called Bristol, which is in Britain, and uh, practicing there. And so this is called Ulcus Abdominis, Intestina Tuncrasa Tenua Penetrans Sanitatum. So abdominal ulcer, penetrating the large and small intestines healed. It's written in Latin. So I'm going to read it in Latin and then I'm going to say what it says in English. Should only take a few minutes. Uxur Wassoni Artificis Horologaria Bristolensis, the wife of Wasson, the Bristol clockmaker. Timorum habuit ingentum in abdomine e region imbilici. She had a swelling in the abdomen in the region of the belly button. We separatus et apertus magnum puris satis laudabilis copium effudit. So swelling burst open 
and poured out a large quantity of pus. Dum agroter taret a cum pluribus medicis et chirurgis, quia papercula erat gratis visitatum. Because of it, a lot of doctors and surgeons, because she was poor, treated her for free, visited her for free. In curationis progressu aliquando portio caeli nonunquam et feces cum pura exibant. So in the course of the treatment, uh, sometimes quantities of chyle, fluid from the small intestine, and feces, which is from the large intestine, would come out of it. Medicis quorum ego unis eram inotuit ulcis intestina tum crassa tum tenua penetrasit. So because of this, uh, the doctors of which he was one thought that uh, or understood that it penetrated the large and the small intestine. Convaluit tamem preter omnium spem et postea fetus aliquot vivos et valentis peperit. So she healed from beyond all hope and later had a live and healthy baby, gave birth to a live and healthy baby. So this would not normally have been a survivable or not normally have been a situation you would expect someone to survive from. Because typically when and the large intestine is open into the bloodstream, the contamination uh, leads to sepsis. It leads to uh, the body being overwhelmed with bacteria and dying. And in the case of this person, it didn't. And we don't really know why, because um, he doesn't really say what, uh, what the um, treatment consisted of. In, in, in all these cases, he's very very hush hush about what exactly he uses to treat people or what exactly they do for treatment other than he uses a lot of water from from healing wells um but uh besides that he doesn't talk a lot about which which remedies he uses but i think what he mostly wanted us to know is that it's possible for there to be an ulcer that goes through all of these things which we now know quite a bit about these and certain inflammatory conditions will create what are called fistulas, which are sort of like tunneling that leads from the digestive system to the, to the outside and that it was possible for people to heal from them. So uh, hopefully, you know, that's not something you ever have to work with. Uh, it's mostly something you would see in what we would nowadays call Crohn's disease. Um, they did not have that term for it at that time, but uh, can happen in other situations too. But that's something that would come from a chronic inflammation of the digestive system, uh, which is a you know a big deal. And that now there would be you know uh, more more options for surgical treatment of something like that. But. Uh, Back in those days, people treated it with uh, with herbs and minerals and things like that because that's what existed. And you know, if if all went well, people lived. So so it is possible. Um, but uh, yeah, so when you're working with people um, strategically, a lot of what you want to do is reduce inflammation, and that would go for a situation like that. And it also goes for the common stuff. Um, Inflammation is pretty much common to all of it. Uh, if there is something that seems to be infectious, like if they have gotten it from someone else, or if they, if the, if a bunch of people got it together who all ate the same thing, then that's a pretty good indication it was from the food. Uh, in those situations, you would want to be giving something that would help to work against the bacteria or viruses. And in all cases, you want to be working on reducing inflammation. And sometimes you want to be working on reducing nausea because nausea feels really terrible to people and reducing diarrhea some of the time. A lot of the time, if the diarrhea is manageable, it might be a good idea to just 
let it run its course because it is actually doing the useful work of trying to remove pathogens from the body, trying to get stuff out that needs to go out. Uh, and you don't necessarily want to slow that process down unless the person is either losing too much fluid or unless they need for the sake of uh, what they have to do in their life to not um, be needing to spend all day on the toilet because they have such bad diarrhea. So sometimes suppressing the symptom is the practical thing to do, um, but not all the time because you really do want to help the body to get rid of whatever is causing the problem when that is a possibility. So, um, so nausea is, uh, is the same way, you know, it is definitely in some cases working to get rid of stuff that is in the stomach. Um, and this could be a substance that doesn't agree with somebody, especially alcohol. Uh, alcohol is, you know, something that often is at the root of nausea for people and that tends to be self-limiting you know it usually goes away in a few hours so people usually don't worry too much about it but it can also be um sometimes people get nauseous as a result of movement uh and disorientation from movement sometimes people feel nauseous uh for neurogenic reasons you know that may be being anxious makes them makes them nauseous. Um, motion sickness is kind of kind of tied into the nervous system as well. Um, of course, early pregnancy, blood sugar fluctuations often cause nausea, and that's something that can most readily be dealt with, not just by suppressing the symptoms, but but by um, helping with uh, helping to raise the blood sugar up a little bit or stabilize it with food. Um, but if that doesn't work, uh, then, then herbal things can be helpful too. So, uh, probably the herbal remedy that's best known for nausea is ginger. And, uh, ginger is a really nice plant, uh, when it comes to that sort of thing, because it's pretty strong. You know, if you taste it, it's spicy. It has a powerful flavor to it. You can tell it's really doing something. It's usually effective and it's very well tolerated and very safe. So, uh, you know, people don't tend to overdose on ginger or really even have any bad side effects from, from uh, consuming it. Uh, it has a very long and illustrious track record, which I'll talk about in a little bit. But uh, it's it's very uh, it's a very well tolerated herb that's pretty decent for nausea. Um, so that's something that uh, is good to uh, to know about, um, and is something that a lot of people are already familiar with. Uh, Ginger candy that's either like a hard candy or a taffy type of candy can be an easy way to take it because the flavor of it is very helpful. And because you're not having, if you're uh, taking it as a medicine, sometimes that can be hard to swallow. Like, for example, if somebody's nauseous and they try to take tablets or pills, that might not go so well liquids they're going to do a little bit better with if it's a small amount of liquid like a very concentrated tea or something like that for pain i often have people just eat ginger like chop off a inch long section of ginger root and chew it up a little bit and then swallow it and wash it down with some water but a person with nausea can't really do that so um, one of the traditional ways that ginger is used for nausea is by taking powdered ginger, mixing it into some water, and then letting it sit for a few minutes while the powder settles to the bottom of the liquid, and then pouring off the part of the liquid that's not the powder and having the person drink that. Uh, that is usually a pretty strong, pretty concentrated way to take it. 
that uh, doesn't require somebody to put a whole lot of fluid into their system. It uh, doesn't require them to keep down a lot of material uh, and is very texturally pretty neutral. So that's uh, something that that's that's a helpful way, way of doing it sometimes for nausea. Part of the reason that it works for nausea is because it creates a warm feeling in the stomach. So warming things, including heat on that area of the body, are sometimes helpful for nausea. Um, so those are uh, good things to know about nausea. There are other herbs um, that, are, that are used. Of course, cannabis has become pretty widely used as a home remedy in recent years. And it's well known as a thing for nausea. Uh, on the plus side, it works without having to keep anything down. The person doesn't have to swallow anything. So for very severe nausea, which is often induced by medicines like chemotherapy, uh, for very severe nausea, sometimes it's really helpful. Um, on the downside, it's expensive, it's potentially illegal, and it does tend to uh, affect the way that people feel, make them feel high, make them feel sometimes paranoid or whatever. So those are, you know, some pros and cons of that particular type of treatment to weigh. Um, another herb that I like pretty well for nausea is lavender. Lavender is calming and it's soothing. So it will soothe the stomach and it's a little bit warming in a different way than ginger is. It's almost like it's warm and cool at the same time. Um, but uh, it has like a minty spiciness to it. And in addition to its aromatic character. So it tends to soothe and calm the stomach if the stomach is feeling queasy, quivery, tight that sort of thing. So that can be a really good thing for nausea in some people. Some people like mint for nausea. I find that uh, peppermint for nausea is kind of hit and miss. In some people, it does feel soothing to them. And then in other people, it, it makes it immediately and dramatically worse. And sometimes it can be hard to tell which of those uh, outcomes you're going to get. Just a moment, I'll be right back. No. 
So another thing that can be helpful uh, with nausea is having a less visually stimulating environment. So if somebody is around strobe lights, if they're around you know any kind of flashing lights, movement, uh, often television, watching television, sometimes that will make it worse. So having people avoid those things can sometimes be helpful. And I may have told you about this before, but there's a pressure point just on the inside of the elbow right here. And there's like sort of a bony prominence right there. And then just, just up towards the armpit from that is a little indentation. And that is a good place uh, to put some pressure in order to relieve nausea. And I, I use that point pretty often. Uh, if I have, for example, if I'm working at the medicine wagon at an event, and somebody comes to me and they're nauseous. That's something that, that I will do. Sometimes things that are absorbent, uh, like foods that are absorbent and dry, like crackers or something like that, will help a little bit with nausea as well. So those are some, some strategies for working with nausea, which is very common and tends to be really unpleasant for people. Um, the only time nausea is really actually dangerous is if somebody is having enough of it to become dehydrated, which is unusual, um, or if they are uh, impaired enough that it's hard for them to be fully awake and then they're at risk of inhaling it. So. You know, if someone has taken, for instance, um, opiates and alcohol and they're vomiting, but they're not fully awake, then that can be a dangerous situation. Um, but for the most part, nausea, you know, uncomplicated by other situations, is not a dangerous situation. It's just really unpleasant. Mm -hmm. So then... The other side of the body's attempts to purge itself through the digestive system is diarrhea. And like I said, there are a lot of different remedies for it, but there are a lot, a lot of reasons to let it run its course too, which you know specifically is just that the body is trying to get rid of something um, in a lot of cases. And this is, this is only true in cases where it is a short-lived new thing, where it's an acute situation that has just come up. You know, someone has gotten sick or they've eaten something bad and they're having a lot of diarrhea. It's not, not the case in something like inflammatory bowel syndrome where someone has diarrhea all the time. Uh, there's really, there in that situation, there's just inflammation and the body is running fluid through it, but it's there's nothing for it to wash out. Um, but if it's, you know, foodborne illness or waterborne illness, a lot of the time there will be diarrhea that's just happening to try and wash out pathogens. Um, some of those include E. coli and salmonella. Like I mentioned before, clostridium, including clostridium difficile, which is an infection that people often get after taking antibiotics or uh, Clostridium botulinum, which is uh, another food poisoning organism that can be very dangerous. Um, so those are some, some of the different bacteria that cause, that cause diarrhea. There are also viruses as well. And sometimes it's really not any of those things. It's just that maybe the body has encountered some substance that it doesn't really like, that doesn't feel good to it, and it's trying to get it out of there. So staying hydrated and having adequate electrolytes is the most important thing and of those the hydration is by far the more likely to get thrown off um, people can lose a lot of fluid through diarrhea and so it's something where especially if it's accompanied by nausea and the person might not feel like drinking fluids it's really important to keep an eye on that and to try and uh, have the person drink fluids if they're at all possible, if they're at all able to, uh, even though they might feel disinclined to. So sometimes treating nausea allows you to keep a person hydrated, and that can be pretty important. Um, nausea can also be dangerous if it goes on long enough, 
as well if someone is becoming malnourished because uh, food is not feeling good to them. That, that's definitely a thing that happens. But uh, in, in terms of short-lived uh, diarrheal illnesses, self-limiting diarrheal illnesses, uh, astringents can be helpful. Astringents are uh, things that cause tissue to firm up and tighten up, and they have a drying effect on the fluid-producing tissue in the digestive system. So, uh, for example, oak is one that I use sometimes, uh, and it will tend to slow the bowels down. Um, there is a remedy that I have here that is syrup made from the roots of blackberries, and that is really good for that particular uh, situation. It's If you get too much oak, it, it will make you feel nauseous because it's making your stomach feel too dry inside, and so your body tries to purge it. But uh, the blackberry is less likely to do that. Black walnut hull extract, also good for this, also good for slowing down the bowels by uh, by its astringent property. So that's something that, that is helpful sometimes. Um, there is also soluble fiber. You have to get a lot of soluble fiber in order to counter diarrhea. But if you get dry soluble fiber, like raw oats, for instance, um, that doesn't, it has a lot of ability to absorb water, but you're not taking it in a form that already contains a lot of water. And that will help to absorb the water that's already in your digestive system. And that can be a really helpful thing uh, for helping the stool to have some form to it and to move through the body more slowly, which is of course allowing you to get out more nutrients and also probably making it a lot easier to do things like drive somewhere or be at work. Um, seaweeds also fall into this category and all of these things that contain these soluble fibers that have like a slippery texture to them they are what we might describe as amphoteric meaning that they can help the bells to move and they can also help to slow them down depending on how much water you take with them because they absorb water and in so doing turn into a slippery type of substance uh, and that goes for the oats and it goes for the seaweed and lots of other things. Rice, for instance, um, corn, uh, meal, uh, these things will all absorb a lot of fluid and will help to uh, create a certain texture of stool that's not completely liquid. And so that's uh, often a better thing to do with the digestive system rather than just putting in something that is completely suppressive to peristalsis, uh, like, well, that's completely drying, like uh, like the oak or the walnut would be, or the blackberry uh, um, roots. Um, in addition to that, uh, to those strategies, there are also things that actually greatly de decrease the movement of peristalsis. And this is, would especially apply to uh, things in the poppy family. Um, for example, uh, well, opium poppy does it, but you know that's not so easy to get. But California poppy uh, is another one that has this property as well. Um, the wood poppies, which uh, grow in the woods here. Let me see if I can show you what I mean by this. Mm -hmm. these are wood poppies and um, they're very abundant in our woods in the springtime uh, they're bitter and they'll make the liver produce some juices but for the most part they will slow peristalsis way down um, 
the kind of just sort of by peristalsis, I mean just the movement along the digestive tract, they will sort of uh, put those muscles to sleep, basically. Um, sedate those muscles so that they're not moving things through. I only ever use that type of remedy in very severe cases. Uh, I find that it's generally not necessary. So the soluble fiber thing is the least invasive, least disruptive thing you can do that might help diarrhea to be more manageable. The astringents are um, more intense than that. And then the uh, the sedatives for the digestive system are even more intense than that. And the sedatives for the digestive system also have a sedative effect on the rest of the body. So there is that, that as a major downside. Um, although with wood poppy, it's actually pretty weak in that category. It's not very sedative, uh, but it is somewhat. Um, just n nothing on the same order as opium or something like that. But those sorts of things uh, help to immobilize the digestive system and can on very rare occasions and for short periods of time be appropriate to use to control diarrhea. But the main thing, like I said before, is you want to stay hydrated and then also getting soluble fiber. Uh, those, between those two things, it usually makes things more manageable without uh, without exposing the body to the continued presence of whatever diarrhea causing pathogen it might have. So that's uh, a general overview of uh, some of the things we would do for those two situations. Another situation I want to talk about, um, and there's a lot more that can be said about the digestive system, but another situation that I want to talk about is inflammation in the digestive system. A lot of people are out there walking around with a lot of inflammation going on in their digestive tracts. And a lot of the time we don't know why that is. And we have names for certain patterns that are recognizable, like inflammatory bowel syndrome or Crohn's disease. But it's not necessarily the case that we know why they're happening to that particular person or, or anything like that. We just you know know what it is based on clinical presentation. Uh, but both of those situations and many others involve serious ongoing inflammation to the digestive system, which often results in a lot of pain, a lot of missed days of work and productivity, uh, a lot of suffering, and sometimes leads to malnutrition and uh, can sometimes, in the case of Crohn's disease, can sometimes lead to the sort of uh, uh, side tracks or fistulas like what we heard about in the Latin case here. Uh, so reducing that inflammation is really important if, if that's going on. Um, and to refresh from the inflammation, when we talked about inflammation, some of the things you'd be looking for would be swelling, pain, hotness, redness. Um, so Often not all of those are present because, or at least not all of those are observable because it's deep within the body. Um, certainly there would be no redness uh, anywhere that you could see. Um, but uh, pain is very frequently the case. Excessive movement as a result of the pain is also a big part of it sometimes too. Swelling, bloating, distension of the abdomen, very common in those types of scenarios. So that's a, that's a part of it as well. Um, and then, you know, di disruption with uh, bowel regularity where people are sometimes having long periods of time with no bowel movements or sometimes having a lot of them in short succession and in at unpredictable times. So those are all things that you would look at that would be signs of inflammation. And of course there's inflammation with short-term sickness as well, but if it's something that's been going on for a long time and doesn't have uh, any obvious cause, then that's a little bit of a different situation. So some of the things we would do for that uh, would include 
Well, basically, when I have that situation, the first thing I like to do is give the person a combination of different anti-inflammatories. Uh, I'll often use multiple different anti-inflammatories that are from different parts of the plant kingdom. So, for instance, um, I often would use turmeric, uh, and I would often use that along with uh, wintergreen and... Sometimes I would also include something like frankincense or trillium. And these are all different plants that have anti-inflammatory properties. And they're different types of anti-inflammatory. So for instance, the trillium is a bitter root that contains steroid type anti-inflammatories in it. The wintergreen is an aromatic leaf that contains salicylates, the same types of things that are in willow leaves and bark or violet leaves and petals. Frankincense is its own thing. It's aromatic. It contains some, some substances that are unique and novel and anti-inflammatory. So combining things like that so that you have the most chances of disrupting the inflammation because you're hitting it with multiple different uh, strategies for reducing inflammation is the approach that I usually use in that situation. Um, and it usually works. It doesn't work all the time, but it usually does. Uh, a lot of people recommend elimination diets for uh, bowel inflammation. And that can be really good if you ever find yourself having bowel inflammation that's going on for a long time. Uh, Cutting most foods out of your diet, maybe even just going down to a couple of things like chicken and rice, and then slowly adding things back in to see if anything caused a specific problem. The downside to that is that often you don't find anything, and that can be frustrating. And that if you're trying to get someone else to do it besides your own self, it can be very difficult to. It's, it's uh, I used to recommend elimination diets to people. I used to tell people, you know, go home and do this elimination diet and then gradually add foods back into your diet. And I don't know that anyone ever actually did, you know, so like now I educate people about the possibility of doing something like that, but I don't operate under the assumption that when I see them at follow up in two weeks that they're going to have tried it at all. Um, because it's just, it's, it's difficult and changing diet is something that a lot of people really hate doing. So it's good to know about that sort of thing. Uh, I would definitely do it if it were my own self, or at least I like to think I would, but, uh, but most people don't seem to be that interested in doing it. So, you know, recommending it is kind of not as helpful as one might hope. Um, so another very common scenario that we run into with the digestive system is indigestion, sometimes also called dyspepsia, or uh, when there's pain, uh, reflux, burning sensations, uh, at the upper part of the stomach, uh, or in the upper abdomen. And, uh, this ties in with heartburn and GERD, and uh, these are very common situations for people. They become more common as people get older, um, but they're not unusual in younger people either. And there are a number of things that can be going on that can contribute to this. One of which is sluggish bowels. If somebody's constipated, it often makes it so that they have reflux and indigestion. Um, so dealing with that if it's an issue is, is something that can be pretty important. Um, sometimes it's just that the body is not producing 
enough or a good enough quality of digestive juices. And so it's trying to make up for that by churning them around more, stirring the pot more sort of. Um, and so it, a lot of the over-the-counter things for this would be antacids, uh, things like calcium carbonate that just inactivate stomach acid. And that is one way to do it, but it only works for a few hours and then it's softened back. So another thing you can do is actually the opposite of that, which is to increase stomach acid and hopefully get better quality of stomach acid. Um, and before we talked about bitters and how those can be helpful for digestion, and that, that applies to this situation as well. Um, licorice is something that is often very often helpful. Um, have it in the jar that says mullen, which is kind of weird, but this is a licorice extract. And uh, that helps with um, pain and cramping in the stomach. Uh, helps to um, get things to move in the right direction. There are also some herbs like, well, even like lemon juice that will help with that. Apple cider vinegar is a very common remedy that people use for indigestion. Uh, and it, it usually works. Let's get it over here now. But, uh, oh, there it is, yeah. Cider vinegar. So that's something that just a spoonful of that often helps uh, with stomach acid and with indigestion. And, you know, like I said, it's kind of the opposite strategy of taking an antacid, but sometimes it works uh, better. So that's another very common scenario. Constipation is another really common scenario. And we've talked a little bit about that before. Um, and, you know, getting plenty of fluids is the most important thing. Uh, and then there are some laxatives that are kind of based on soluble fiber of the sorts that we just talked about a few minutes ago. And then there are also more stimulating laxatives like Senna, uh, which we saw some Senna on our herb walk the other day. Um, Senna is uh, in bloom right now. Let me see. I'll find you a picture of that one too. I have one here, I think. Hmm. No, that's not it. Uh, no, it seems like maybe I don't have it. But Senna is, is blooming right now. It has yellow flowers. Uh, pea or yeah, pea plant type, bean type leaves it, it, and licorice are in the same family. Um, and it's, it's a mild stimulant laxative that is used. Basically it gets in the intestines, mildly stimulates or irritates the walls of the intestines of the large intestine, causes it to produce more fluid, which helps to, uh, move, uh, fecal material that has gotten stuck by being too dry. So constipation is often at the root of bloating and gas. If somebody has gas a lot, it's often because things aren't moving through quickly enough and it's allowing too much time for gas to build up from regular microbial activity. So that's uh, something that... Uh, it often gets treated along together. Um, and there are stronger stimulant laxatives than Senna, like aloe latex or buckthorn. Uh, but I, I usually don't use those. I use such things as that very, very infrequently. 
Um, mostly if I'm using the really strong stuff, it's because somebody was on opiates and they've come off of them and they're really constipated afterwards. And doing something like that once to get things moving can be helpful. But doing it over and over again kind of creates a situation where maybe they need it to function or need it to be able to uh, have bowel movements. So I don't don't want to create that situation. So I use them very infrequently and mostly stick to fiber based stuff uh, and lots of fluids as, as ways of, of treating those types of situations. Another really common digestive system issue is ulcers. People will sometimes get a pain, a burning sensation in their stomach area. It tends to get better after they've eaten as opposed to reflux, which often gets worse after somebody has eaten. Um, and uh, ulcers are basically sores on the inside of the digestive system. And they can be caused by some different conditions, but very often they involve um, infection by an organism called Heliobacter pylori. Heliobacter pylori is just kind of a fairly common stomach bacteria that often doesn't do very much, but when people have ulcers, it's usually in there. So um, golden seal is actually helpful for this. Golden seal is um, one of the best known and best loved remedies here in Kentucky. Uh, it's got a very yellow coloring to it. And uh, we saw a bunch of this out on the plant walk as well. Um, golden seal is an ecologically sensitive plant. It takes several years for it to grow to maturity and is very picky about where it grows. But uh, if you have a well-tended stand of it, it can be a wonderful thing. And one of the wonderful things that it can do is help heal up ulcers. So if somebody has that type of situation, which sometimes shows up because of blood in the stool, sometimes shows up because of a burning pain in the stomach area that gets better when they eat, um, either of those things would be a good reason to try some golden seal. Um, usually, the dose I would use of that is about three milliliters at a time with water and uh, doing that once or twice a day. And usually that will take care of things in pretty short order. So those are by far not the only types of things that are likely to happen in someone's digestive system in your presence um, or that they might come to you for help with, but those are very common situations. Diarrhea, constipation, ulcers, indigestion, inflammation, and nausea and vomiting. Uh, so hopefully that gives you some strategies to work with each of those types of conditions. And, uh, you know, of course, if you run into something that you're not quite sure what to do with, feel free to reach out to me. But those are, those are some things that are likely to, uh, you know, if you end up doing herbal medicine for any size of a group of people, even if it's just your own household, you're likely to run into a lot of those types of things. Good for a large town full of people for decades at a time. You'll probably end up seeing lots and lots, lots, lots of each of them over and over. So, give me just a minute, and then I'll come back and talk about a couple of specific herbs for this week.
All right, so. So one of the herbs I want to talk about this time is ginger, which I've already mentioned as being a really common and really decent remedy for nausea. Ginger is a plant that grows, it's native to Asia, uh, grows in tropical-ish areas. Um, let's see. I'm sure if I have a picture of it or not. No, I only have videos of it, which I cannot share on here. Um, so ginger is, uh, it's a tropical plant. Um, it's been used by and written about by English speaking people for about 800 years or so. Um, so trade routes of ginger as a spice have existed for a really long time. And uh, it's been popularly used far outside of its native range for a very long time. Um, in the areas where it, where it grows, uh, it's been, uh, it has a written history of use going back to the beginning of writing. So, you know, when, when people invented writing, plant medicine was some of the first stuff that they wrote about. And ginger is one of those plants that was that was there from the beginning of that process. So um, it has, of course, its uses for the digestive system and its uses for pain are some of the main things that it's known for in uh Medieval times when people were thinking about the doctrine of signatures, uh, they considered the fact that the rhizome looked like vertebrae or joints to be a sign that it was good for arthritis. Um, nowadays, people would say that it is a cyclooxygenase 2 inhibitor, that it interrupts an enzymatic chain reaction that helps to, that is part of the creation of inflammation in the body. And someday, hundreds and hundreds of years from now, people will look back at that theory and think that it was just as superstitious as people now think about the doctrine of signatures theory. But uh, the plant still does what it does, and we know that what it does from clinical observation, from seeing what happens to people when they take it. So the most noticeable thing about ginger flavor-wise is that it's hot, it's spicy. Um, Ginger actually changes the way that your nervous system interprets temperature uh, by opening up a pathway in your nervous system that would normally not open up until it reaches a higher temperature. And so it's uh, helping to um, uh, helping the body to perceive heat, to perceive hotness. And it's also opening up the blood vessels and allowing circulation to flow. So that's one of the wonderful things about ginger is that it works on inflammation as well as stagnation. And as you remember from early on in this class, inflammation and stagnation are two of the main things that characterize illness, two of the main things that give rise to a lot of different types of clinical patterns of illness. So ginger is good for both of those things. And because it's a kitchen spice, um, or well, not really because it's a kitchen spice, it's more like the reason that it's a kitchen spice. It has a strong flavor, strong amount of medicine in it without being dangerous. Um, so, you know, people can uh, brew beer out of it, shred it up and mix it with water and let it start fermenting and have, you know, something that is almost like a very high carbohydrate food that's all made out of the spice and uh and it will still um not be dangerous at all so it's a very nice warming circulation enhancing remedy that helps to quell nausea and helps with pain and in some cases uh especially in joint pain that's made worse from the cold 
ginger can be just an absolute superstar remedy. Uh, there are other things that it's not as good for, like pains from sunburn. Doesn't really help with that. Uh, at least not when taken internally. Uh, so, you know, it's, it depends on the type of pain. But, um, but in the right situation, sometimes ginger is as good as anything out there. It's, it's a very uh, useful, powerful remedy without being, uh, without being dangerous, without being sedating or stimulating, um, without changing how the immune system works very much or anything like that. So it's a, it's a really good thing to have. Um, if you want to grow ginger in a temperate area, it's easy enough to do as an indoor plant or in a greenhouse. It needs lots and lots of light, uh, which probably means ha having either a greenhouse that it's in where it's getting light sunlight all the time, that the sun is up anyway, or else maybe if it's in a window or something, you might have to have some artificial light shining on it too. But uh, if you get ginger from the store, and you plant it in sand and you keep it watered and you give it plenty of light, it will grow. And uh, it can grow really nice looking flowers. It can grow big uh, decorative looking foliage and uh, can, can be a lovely house plant uh, and also can be a source of medicine if you like growing it yourself. So I, I've often grown ginger in my clinic in uh, planted in big apothecary jars full of sand and uh you know not not only for looks but also for for use to have it on hand and use it as needed um so it's uh you know it's a good remedy to have around you can use sliced ginger as a poultice um if you want to put it on something like uh uh, any kind of swelling on the skin, blemishes, uh, moles, anything like that, you can actually slice a piece of ginger and tape it or wrap it to that area. And it will often help to uh, make whatever it is go away just because it's increasing the blood flow into the area and then the body takes care of whatever it needs to take care of itself. So ginger is topically good for increasing blood flow to places. Um, if I have to do a whole big area like somebody's foot, I usually won't use ginger. I'll usually use cayenne salve or something like that, but you could use ginger. Um, and, and people have, people have, uh, crushed ginger into a paste and wrapped it around inflamed joints to get the swelling to go back down. And that works too. Uh, taking it internally is also good. Uh, it's also very helpful for that sort of thing. So, uh, yeah, ginger is generally pretty readily available as a fresh herb because people use it in cooking. So I always work with fresh ginger. You can get powdered ginger, and uh, that's good for some things. Uh, like I said, you can mix the powder with water and let the powder settle out of the water. Uh, and that's one way of preparing ginger. But I really like, for one thing, I like being able to physically recognize the plant material, which is a harder thing to claim that you do when you're looking at just the powder. But uh, uh, I, I pretty much always work with uh, with fresh ginger when I'm making someone remedies or or whatever. When having tinctures made, I, I uh, the last couple years, Aoife has been, my daughter has been making most of the remedies that I use in the practice, most of the tinctures, not compounding them, but just making the base tinctures. Um, and so, you know, when, when I'm having her do that, I ever use fresh ginger rather than dried or powdered or anything like that, because it's just uh, got more vitality to it. And, uh, Ginger is one of those plants that does contain a lot of water. So if you slice ginger up and dry it, you'll actually end up with a much smaller quantity.
a much smaller quantity than it was when it was fresh. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Uh, but, you know, it, it's really, uh, it's a good herb to use fresh. One of my ones that I most strongly prefer to use that way. The other herb that I want to talk about today is slippery elm. Slippery elm is the bark of a tree. And as the name suggests, it is slippery. It's slimy when it's wet. So usually uh, when people are harvesting slippery elm, it is not the outer layer of the bark but it's the inner layer of the bark that's closest to the wood of the tree. And, and uh, it's when it's freshly peeled, it's a white color uh, or just slightly off white color, turns more of a creamy color as it dries. Um, it contains a lot of polysaccharides, starches that when they're mixed with cold water or hot water, but cold water is sufficient they will create a sort of gelatinous type of substance. And that is what gives the plant a lot of its medicinal properties is this, uh, this gelatinous type of substance that is made from, from the bark. So it's really important to understand with this particular thing that harvesting slippery elm is a skill of its own. It's definitely, um, so this is a large tree, uh, typically a, a, you know, a full tree sized tree, not, not a small tree shrub type of thing. Uh, if you harvest it wrong, you can kill the whole tree. Uh, and because a whole tree doesn't even contain that much bark, it's important to understand that a pound of slippery elm bark represents an enormous investment by the forest that it's growing in. So for the tree to grow to the size where there is enough of the tree to be able to harvest a pound of bark, for instance, that's a big deal. The way that people harvest slippery elm when they're not trying to kill the trees or acting uh, when, they're, when they're harvesting it the way it should be harvested is either by pruning a single branch off of a tree or finding one small tree in a stand of trees and sacrificing that particular tree um, and then peeling the bark off of it. So if you have, um, let's say you have a log that's four feet long and maybe about this big around. By the time you peel the bark, remove the outer bark and dry it, that's gonna be only ounces of slippery elm bark, very, very little. So it's, uh, it's important to realize that this is something that, uh, it's readily abundant as an herb. You can go and buy it um, pretty easily. It's not that expensive, but the part of the reason it's not that expensive is because <clears throat> People aren't necessarily growing it themselves. They're going out into the national forest or somewhere like that and getting it. Uh, a lot of the slippery elm that is used medicinally is actually gathered here in Kentucky by a couple of families that do it and have done it for generations. And uh, I wasn't even aware of that until a couple of years ago when I was um, speaking to a group called Traditional Medicinals, a company that makes tea. Uh, they had me speaking at a um, company retreat, doing an herb walk, and I showed them a slippery elm tree. And they were talking about how most of the slippery elm bark that they get is from here in Kentucky, from 
from these few families. And, and as it turns out, a lot of what's in commerce in the United States is from that same source, uh, not only what goes to that company. Um, so, yeah, get, gathering it is uh, is definitely a task, uh, and a skilled piece of work to, to be able to do it in a sustainable way where you're not killing trees by incorrectly pruning them or decimating stands by taking too many of the trees out of them. Uh, slippery elm, like other elm trees, is susceptible to Dutch elm disease, which is a fungal infection that kills a lot of elms in this part of the country or in this part of the world, really. So it's uh, yeah, important to... to be careful about it and uh, you know, perhaps buy it from a trusted source rather than try and harvest it yourself. Um, unless you have a, a good place to harvest it from, that's a stand of, of plants that you feel like you can contribute something positively to and not just take from. Uh, so as far as its medicinal properties go, it's a little bit nutritive. So it has been, uh, when, when, it's, uh, when it's the shredded bark, the bark is often shredded into sort of a fluff and then that's mixed with water and that will create sort of a gelatinous substance. And that can be eaten and that has been used as food for people whose throats are too sore or who are too weak or too sick to take other forms of nutrients. And that can be... Uh, something you can do with that drinking it for a sore throat is the thing that i've used it for the most in my own practice uh, it's very soothing to the throat it's mildly antibacterial if somebody has strep it does have some ability to uh, make the throat a less welcoming place to strep germs uh, so that's a, a helpful property that it has and it's you know soothing because of its texture it's also a little bit, has a little bit of that same amphoteric effect as far as being uh, able to act as a lax laxative, but also being able to slow down diarrhea that I mentioned earlier. Although so many other things that are so much easier to come by also have that, so I don't really use it for, for that. I mostly use it for throat stuff. The other thing that I use it for is topically um, on wounds, either as a poultice or just as a piece of the bark that has been soaked in water and put over the wound. Uh, it helps to keep the edges of the wound moist so that healing can occur more readily. Because uh, if somebody has a big gash and maybe they get it stitched up or whatever, as it's healing, sometimes the edges of the two sides will dry and shrink back from each other. And so Slippery Elm helps to keep that shrinking back and shriveling from happening. And that creates an environment that allows faster healing and healing with less scarring. So for that, my preference is to use um, a whole piece of bark. Uh, strips of bark are easy to harvest if you're harvesting it yourself. They used to be they used to be sold in that form. Um, but it's not so much anymore. And one of the reasons that people stopped selling it in that form, or perhaps one of the reasons they were selling it in that form in the first place is because people were using it um, as an instrument to uh, perform dilation and curatage because uh, in other words, to scrape out the inside of the uh, uterus um, because as it gets soft, as it soaks up water, it gets soft and it expands, but it's also still has some tensile strength. So people were using it to perform abortions back uh, in the 60s, and it was pulled off of the market sometime around then uh, for that reason. Uh, but, you know, like, like I said, if you're if you're harvesting it, and then after that, you know, people just got more used to powdered and shredded herbs, cut and sifted or powdered herbs, which is how you'd buy almost any herb that you bought from an herb uh, supplier like Frontier uh, these days, 
hardly anything is like sliced or in strips or anything like that uh, in contrast to what you would see in say a Chinese apothecary or something where a lot of things are cut in a certain direction or a certain way that's just sort of traditional and uh, makes it more recognizable. But uh, yeah, so slippery elm, if you're harvesting it yourself, you can peel strips of it off. And those strips are also good as uh, something to go under a bandage and over a wound to help uh, as a humectant, as something to keep in moisture and help that healing process to happen. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, there's another kind of famous remedy made from slippery elm, uh, made with slippery elm called people paste powder. And this is a combination of finely ground slippery elm along with powdered myrrh and powdered golden seal. And when that's mixed together, it creates a sort of, uh, slightly adhesive paste-like substance that can be used to put over wounds uh, and to put on scrapes and things like that as a disinfectant and protectant. So the resins and the starches mix together to create this texture. And then the golden seal is an astringent and also you know kills kills germs. All three of them have antibacterial properties. The proportions you would use for that are uh, four parts slippery elm to one part each of uh, golden seal powder and myrrh powder. This is called people paste powder. I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure which it was. It was. Uh, it came from an herb book that was popular in the '90s, which may have been called Ten Essential Herbs, but I'm not certain that it was. Um, but uh, it's not my original recipe. It's someone else's and uh, hang on just a second. I don't, I want to give them credit. So I need to look up who's exactly that was. Um, I wasn't really able to determine who who originated it. It's uh it's something that's been around the herbal community for a while, uh for for decades. Um and uh there are a lot of different recipes out there for it and uh a lot of different commercial products based on it apparently, which I didn't really know or hadn't really looked for or at before this. But uh yeah, there there are seemingly a lot of versions of it out there. I first learned about it uh when I was working in um these gatherings called rainbow gatherings that take place in the national forests and they're sort of uh hippie gatherings. Um and I was working uh in the first aid station and uh that's where I first encountered it. Um and, you know, it's, it's, uh, I don't really like putting powder on wounds so much because I worry about there being like little bits of inclusions, uh, but on something very surfacey like a scrape, it's, it's fine. And on a wound that's started to close up, then, then that's okay too. And just like what I said about laying a strip of something on, it will create uh, an environment with some moisture in there. And it will also help to keep infection from setting in, uh, and create a barrier, uh, because it's like a paste that's uh, caked on the area, it's going to create a barrier to keep outside uh, contamination from getting into or on the wound. So that's, uh, you know, a combination uh, formula that uses um, 
slippery elm powder along with some other things and uh it's another another good way to to use this plant but like i said in my own practice most of the time when i use slippery elm it's for a sore throat specifically because it's just really useful for that and a really simple remedy that you can make is if you get powdered slippery elm and you mix just a tiny little bit of honey with it um until you get something that is a solid dough-like consistency and then you can roll them out into little balls and then the slippery elm will continue to absorb the water from the honey until you're left with like a little lozenge a little round hard piece of candy semi-hard piece of candy that somebody can suck on that will help to soothe their throat and so that's like uh that's called a pastille, that form of uh, preparing herbal powders and uh, and honey to make a little dough ball sort of thing that can be it can be used as a pill or as a as a piece of candy like that's uh, that's called a pastille. And so a uh, slippery almond honey pastille is a really good way to treat sore throat. Sometimes I would also combine um, an herb called stone root. Uh, which if you're going to use stone root, you just want to get a little bit of it in there to wet the substance before you add the honey in. And uh, then it takes a little bit longer to dry, but not much longer. And it has uh, has a good effect on sore throat and on uh, if someone's losing their voice from having talked a lot, it can be really useful for that. So that is uh, another wonderful use of slippery elm. Now, the thing about slippery elm that sometimes people find objectionable is that it is kind of slimy. So if you have a slippery, a strong tea of slippery elm, it will have a very slimy type of consistency. And that is hard for some people to take. Some, some people are used to it or are not uncomfortable with it. And some people find it texturally just kind of gross or something like that and, uh, and won't take it. So um, one thing that is useful in children and old people and people with sensory issues that might make that especially hard is that you can mix slippery elm in with applesauce and it becomes not quite undetectable because you can still taste it but the texture is not so noticeable at all um, because the applesauce is already like a semi-liquid semi-solid substance so slippery elm's flavor is just kind of like it tastes like wood. It tastes the way that wood smells. Um, it tastes the way that it smells, which is like wood because that's what it is. But uh, it's a particular kind of wood that um, that mixes well with water and becomes edible. So if you mix it in with applesauce, gives it a little bit of a woody flavor to it, but it also uh, really covers up that texture and makes it uh, much more palatable. So. If you're giving it to little children, uh, that's a really easy way to do it. That's a really useful way to do it. And it still has that throat soothing type of quality um, without, without them having to uh, drink a cup of something slippery or slimy feeling. All right. Any questions about either of those herbs? or about the digestive system in general. All right, well, um, speaking of digestion, I this Saturday, the 19th at seven, I'm having this uh, wild food get together at my house and uh, would love to have any and all of you there. And uh, I've got some really good stuff um, planned. Uh, and have begun prepping some of it, uh, planning on making some uh, some stuff with wild mushrooms and some stuff with wild greens. And um, it's uh, if you if you like wild plants, this is a meal that's going to feature quite a few of them. And so hopefully uh, some of you can come to it. And if not, maybe next time.
we'll probably do something similar again in December, but it won't be quite the same because there's really not that much, not as much fun, forageable food that time of the year. Well, hang on a quick second. This question of what type of mushrooms will you be serving? Let's see. I have some, I've been drying some that I've been gathering all year. So I think I have some black trumpet mushrooms that I'm going to use. I have some morels. Um, and the morels I'm going to use along with some venison backstrap in our pie. And then I'm going to have a mushroom stew that's going to have chicken of the woods. Um, what else do we have? I think chicken of the woods, hen of the woods, oysters, um, wood ear. Uh, what else have I got? Um, I think some lion's mane. Uh, multiple different ones that are going to go in the stew and then I think the uh, the morels are going to be in the pie and then the uh, black trumpets are going to be in with the roast porcinis, there's some porcinis also um, and then uh, yeah I think that's all the mushrooms so yeah mul multiple different types of mushrooms uh, most of which will be together in a mushroom stew and some of which will be in other dishes. And uh, yeah, so um, hang on just a second. and let's see so yeah i find that gathering wild food actually helps with my herbal practice quite a lot because it's easier for me to keep track of a few kind of anchor points in the year of growing things so for instance i would be like okay it's blackberry time i need to get out there and get blackberries and while i'm out there getting blackberries there's a whole other cadre of things that I can get at the same time and the same is true with mulberries or with persimmons or you know at different times of the year it's different uh different things that can be gathered in in good sized quantities walnuts are next um I'm actually going to get some this week uh but uh and so part of that gets used medicinally but also while I'm out getting the walnuts I'm going to get some goldenrod and I'm going to get some other uh some other meadow plants, bone set, um, some things like that. So, yeah, I find that having, uh, I think that, I think that going back to the stone age and whatever, we have this tradition of gathering and now we call the food gathering foraging and the herb gathering wild crafting, but it's really all kind of the same thing and they sort of blend into one another. So when I go out gathering, I end up not only foraging, but also wildcrafting. And so being thinking about what harvests are going on in terms of food really helps me to be a better herbalist and to be more in tune with the natural world in terms of what's going on for medicines out there. So I recommend that everybody try it if they get a chance to. And, uh, if you're not so sure about that sort of thing, then, you know, coming over to my house and having some good food there can, can be a, a gentle introduction to it. All right. Well, any any other questions before we go for today? All right. Well, thank you all for coming and I will talk to you again soon.